When they say, I want my lawyer, you tell them, shut up. Your time is expired. Get a lawyer. Coming at you with subversion. It must be because I worked harder than everybody else. Let me tell you something. Somebody invested in roads and bridges. If you got a business, you didn't build that. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. I want you to get mad. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. Get up, go to your windows, open them and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. Hello and welcome to another edition of Subversion. This is the platform in which we will discuss the subject of media, liberty, and music. On this particular segment, we will be talking to Jordan Flady for part two of our episode, War for Culture or Competing Cultures of Warfare. You can find the show notes for this episode at subversionwebcast.com slash culture part two. Things like this force me to reckon with my sometimes conflicting views. I am very critical of public education. I think to the point where other people find me a bit kooky because I see this dynamic with the state running education and having approved curriculum and forcing people to go to uh, some sort of approved school of some kind, or at least the curriculum has to be confirmed and it has to be monitored, that I find it to be a violation of individual liberty to force people to comply with the state as far as how they are to educate their children. I do, from my experience, have a lot of positive experiences with people in public schooling because it was so much a part of my life. So I have this sort of cognitive dissonance in a way, if I could put it that way, because of the inspiring and thought-provoking teachers that I sometimes had. I had a teacher named Mr. Kochler, actually, and he was probably my favorite and most inspirational teacher that I had in high school. He was my English teacher, and I am a high school dropout. Um... So when I dropped out, Mr. Kochler actually got a hold of my cell phone number and called me and I didn't answer and he left a message urging me not to drop out of high school and that I would be ruining my life. And at the time he was right, I was ruining my life. And um, he tried to pull me out of it and he's just a genuinely good person. So even though I'm critical of the system of education that we have. I have a special place in my heart for the people that have taught me through that system. And there are people I value very much in my life who are still public education teachers. And I think that they are doing everything that they are supposed to in their mind. I think they believe that they're doing everything right and that their cause is noble. And I think that they have genuine connections with their students like I had with my teachers. So I don't want to say that everything is necessarily bad with the things that I'm critical of. I always like to give the best version of my opponent's argument, even though online sometimes uh, I'm probably more hyperbolic than I should be. I do mean to I do mean to communicate a genuine sort of base level human conversation about these things because they matter as much to me as they do uh, to anybody else. Another thing I'm very critical of is criminal justice. But I sit down at holiday dinners with my family members who are in law enforcement. So, you know, some of the best people I know are military veterans and Some people I look up to in my family are police officers, so it's really hard for me to separate my very strong opinions on what we employ the government for and the people who engage in these activities. Because ultimately, they are acting in this system. They are not casual bystanders in some sort of way. They are actively part of that system. And given the fact that I'm an American myself, this is one thing that sort of keeps me in check 
this is something that I recognize in my own life and it causes me a moment to reflect and think about if I were treated as just another American to anybody else in the world, people who perhaps are hostile towards America because of consequences downstream from our policies, either foreign policy directly or economic policy. And I just wonder how I would feel if someone were to judge me as part of that group identity, that someone that ruined their lives even, and separate that from the individual that they're communicating with. For me, if I just combine that sort of thought that, hey, I don't like to be judged in that way by someone who has been a victim of some other group uh, and perhaps harmed because of the other group's uh, identity in some sort of prejudice way, and I just sort of think, hey, I'm an American and I'm somehow just one individual as part of the rest of this whole mess by paying taxes and what I do. I do support the actions of the people in the government who use the social apparatus of violence to their whims and whatever special interests that they have, public or private. We can't be too dogmatic about it. We're just all Americans too. Us libertarians that like to sort of jump to demonizing any individual police officers and understand I have that impulse as well. I react very strongly to some of these police shootings that come out in a very emotional way. Sometimes I admit in a very irrational way. I mean, it's an emotionally tough thing to watch someone in the police force shooting uh, some other person for whatever reason it is, even if it's, even if it is the perpetrator committing violence against the police officer, you know, it's still just tough seeing a human get gunned down. So it's a very emotional experience. So that's the lesson that I'd like to impart to you. And it gets into the general theme of this episode, which is just on culture and individualism, because Jordan and I come from a very similar place, ideologically speaking. So there's a lot of things that we agree on as far as how far we take individualism and how this sort of group identity works into the reality of what we are. Let me ask you about the role of government. You've said about taxation in a way that doesn't mince his words, the following. Taxation is immoral, you're told the Libertarian Party News. Uh, would you scrap the tax code altogether? That'd be a pretty good idea, mm -hmm. pretty good start. I, I can qualify it if I'm allowed. Taxation is theft. We apologize for the technical difficulties. The sometimes forbidden notions that will spontaneously occur in this program are not directly the formal views of Subversion Media, Inc. Please be advised. One thing that uh, you had brought up earlier was uh, you were talking about the class warfare that Marxism is sort of built on, right? Since I have the pretext of, of actually having read the literature on the hard left, I do see these parallels, as I've mentioned earlier, between the hard left and the more hard anar anarchist right. Not everybody in the bottom right quadrant is like you know Ben Shapiro or... I'm trying to think of some other sort of people who are driving this sort of right culture war. Uh, Sargon of Akkad. Stefan Molyneux. Stefan, man, and he is so, and it's so depressing because Molyneux was so great. Like 2013, 2014 Molyneux. If you go back and you listen to uh, Joe Rogan, his two episodes with Joe Rogan were phenomenal. I mean, he laid out the ideas like simple and made just the best case for libertarianism that you possibly can jump to three years later and, and he's like saying how Eric Garner kind of deserved to die, basically, you know, I, and I'm being hyperbolic. I really shouldn't, you know, be, be so curt and, and take away what his point was. Um, but essentially he gets into this realm and I think it's more pandering and uh, economic opportunity than anything on his end. I think he knows that he's being dishonest. Um, 
But I don't know, maybe not. Maybe he really is sort of driven by this this sort of cult, if you will. And it's almost like, so the the Marxists, they sort of thought that, you know, these different classes of people act in different ways, not according to their individual interests, but according to these preset notions that you're going to have from having certain upbringings and being in certain classes with certain amounts of wealth, which is obviously absurd. If you know anything about just human nature, and if you've, uh, you know, been anywhere outside of a university in this sort of think tank environment, you know, and if you actually meet rich people. I used to work uh, doing heating and air conditioning for people who had bigger homes and were like, you know, sort of bigger dollar clients. And they're just as human as any of us. They act on the same emotional and uh, rational terms as anybody, in my opinion. So I don't know. I just, I just find those parallels in contrast with these people who are using these group identities of the culture war conversation in these same sort of terms where they think, you know, um, I think the most contentious one right now is, is Muslim. Like all Muslims believe in Sharia law and, you know, we can't have uh, people like that coming into this society or else they're going to change uh, the, our way of life via culture. When in reality, if you sort of uh, pull back, you know, a Pashtun is not the same as like a Wahhabi or, uh, you know, a Sunni and a Shia. You know, like there are just so many different kinds of people that come from the Fertile Crescent. So it's like, you know, they're sort of using these same sort of fallacies. And there's and there's no arguing with them just the same as there's no arguing with a Marxist who just, you know, will refuse to believe that the bourgeoisie are anything but parasitic uh, people who are living off of the stolen wealth of the proletariat. It's just instead of being couched in economic terms, they're couching it in theological and cultural exactly. terms. Exactly. I, I completely understand where you're coming from with that. Uh, the thing, the, the thing that they they seem to the from the the Marxist side, the 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 delineation between proletariat and bourgeoisie is usually referred to as the the ownership of the means of production. Uh, in today's terms, well, even even during when Marx was still alive. He had to coin the petite bourgeoisie because there were, you know, small business owners that were nothing like the feudal lords and the people that he typically associated with the bourgeoisie because these these uh, petite bourgeoisie were small business owners and stuff like that. When the when the capitalist revolution happened, he had to rethink his doctrine because the means of production was no longer limited in the way, it, you know, the way it was when he first started it. Uh, so nowadays, I think of I think of the means of production like MacGyver. Because, you know, people can, pretty much anybody can turn anything into a, into a, a means of producing value. Uh, because value isn't, value isn't necessarily just a, a length of time put into an object or even a tangible object itself. It's, it, it can be the, the propagation of ideas, as you see with online schooling or any number of things. And there's so much you can do from your cell phone and your computer. Uh, there, there, you can buy goods from China via places like DHgate and Alibaba. Have them branded with your logo, you know. Pay a couple bucks for some advertising on Facebook, and boom, your Amazon store is going. You know, anybody can do that from their house, and they don't even have to spend thousands of dollars. You're talking hundreds, if that. Yeah, I mean, uh, technology affords us the opportunities. And, and what's kind of strange is uh, modern day hard leftists. They feel like we're in a post scarcity world, which I I don't think is ever going to happen, even if we had completely autonomous, you know, uh, everything, there's still scarcity in some way because there's only so much beachfront property, for example. Unlimited wants and limited means. It's always going to exist. There's no way to escape it. Yeah, yeah. And I guess the only question is, how is technology going to shape uh, the means of production coming in the future? Which, you know, as we see, it only does, as long as government doesn't get involved, at least, it only serves to help people produce for themselves and sort of cut out these industrialists that were previously a big problem. And if you look at uh, the effect that, for example, the FCC had on, uh, on cell phones, we could have had cell phones in the 70s if it weren't for the FCC and their onerous regulations on, I think it had something to do with like the airwaves, like they were afraid of 
some sort of radio frequency problems. If it, I don't remember the exact technical reason why they justified this, but bottom line is they stopped a technology from advancing. Like, uh, like we were talking about a couple minutes ago with the, uh, the, the means of production and stuff like that. As technology advances, I see the, the production being brought on smaller scales closer. With technologies like the 3D printing, uh, warehousing, the massive uh, you know, AI-guided uh, effective vending services that, uh, that, a, that a modern machine shop could be, as technology grows and advances, I, I, I see it progressing more towards a, you know, a more localized, more, you know, smaller operations and those kind of things. But the same thing in the, in the same way that middlemen uh, throughout history have been, you know, finding ways to get themselves cut out of the market by seizing some other middleman's opportunity. But the same thing is true with culture. As, as technology progresses and communication advances, the world intellectually becomes... Uh, closer, uh, because now people in you know in the the Punjabi region of India and stuff like that can have a conversation with me in real time, or you know relatively real time messaging over Facebook in the in the in the blink of an eye, uh, a thought that they have can be transmitted to me, and likewise I can reciprocate and transmit a thought back. So the the things that would would result in culture, like the the common ideas and shared ideas and the rate of propagation of ideas. And the geographic elements of it are all going away uh, as communication expands. So they're not as powerful of gatekeepers between culture and ideas and people anymore. Um, where what was you know before limited by geography is now just a uh, you know limited by access to the internet, and most people on the planet have access to it. There's no necessary church leader to tell you what God thinks or whatever. Um, you can read it for yourself. And you can explore it in great detail with other people. Uh, like I said, I'm not religious. I was just using it as a metaphor that most people would be able to understand. Because in, in some faiths, uh, there are large swaths of their population that can't read. Uh, which is, which is uh, rough to deal with in today's times because there are some of us that have so much. Uh, but they, they can't read. And the people that are the gateway to ideas are uh, you know, using them to perpetrate their tribe you know to give their to do things for their tribe uh and it's it's progressively waning off you know uh in in terms of the means of production like we talked about earlier it's it anybody can produce things nowadays so now with so much more access to ideas i think we're we're on a technological cusp that's giving us the opportunity to propagate uh good ideas and you know bring the means of of producing new stuff to more and more people so I, I can see it over the course of time waning. Um, it kind of gives me hope for the future in that way. But at the same time, <laughs> there's there's always the danger of the the collective we for whatever you know opposing a dichotomy of you know hey it's them and we, you're part of us and we should go hurt them to stop them from hurting us. And that's always tempting because tribalism is very instinctual to people. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I think we're sort of hardwired for it and. And I don't even necessarily think, I think uh, tribalism can certainly, it can have disastrous consequences. You've heard my thoughts on it. I sort of try to put things through that prism of who are the individuals? Why are they acting the way that they are? I think you, you almost can't stop tribalism in some sort of way because it plays to uh, a part of our human nature that we, we always, ha and I'm always fighting it, you know, and I'm sure you understand that as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's, it's a, there's a, there's a, there's a thing about it. It, I think it actually comes from a, from a, an animalistic, uh, biological thing that we do where we categorize inanimate objects, you know, like, Hey, that thing is round. It's red. Uh, it grew on that tree right there. It's probably kind of like an apple. If it isn't an apple already, I can't tell, you know, we have these tendencies to um, categorize things that are inanimate, and there is a gross, uh, a gross leap, uh, a gross logical leap to say that that people can be categorized the same way. You that's know, a, that's a really good analogy. I never really thought about it in in that way, but that's that's a great analogy. I'll probably have to steal that. <laughs> um, Season the means of production. Ah. <laughs> The memes of production. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. I think that a lot of people 
like on the immigration uh, conversation, they fail to see or at least to talk about the root of all these problems. So the people that are, you know, that are really so upset about Muslim immigrants in Europe, for example, which I don't, I, I don't discount it. There is a problem with uh, the way that the Muslim population is, is acting that are there. Um, but I think that that has something more to do with the failure to integrate and the fact that they're not coming there from some organic desire to, to go there for some sort of economic opportunity. They're going there because, for the most part, from destabilization in their countries that, you know, you could trace it all the way back to the Romans if you wanted to, but I think in more uh, relative terms to the, the modern day, during World War I when the Ottoman Empire was broken up. And I don't think that a lot of people that talk about these things actually understand the history as to what the root of this problem is. All they see is what they've seen in their lifetimes. And it's also through this sort of, uh, through this filter of what they've been taught and these preconceived notions of, you know, America's great and all these Western countries are awesome. So you got to support them and all these other people. Uh, I, I've heard the phrase so many more times than I'm comfortable admitting, but I've heard the phrase, life isn't valuable in the Orient, for example. That's a quote from this documentary on, I, I believe, the first Gulf War. But basically, the documentarian was trying to say that these people, because there are Muslims who trade their, their cousins and their daughters off into sex slavery, that that means that all of them you know, just don't value life, which I find to be, you, you have to really take a lot of logical leaps and deny human nature so much. I mean, even in our most impoverished conditions, I think that most people care about their, their blood and their family. So anyway, I, sort of what I'm getting at is that with these people flooding into these countries, they're coming from destabilized nations, right? And these these people that are upset about them coming into the country, I don't see them as much talking about the actual wars that are causing these stabilizations. If anything, these are the type of people that usually are like, oh, well, you got to look at it from a nuanced perspective. We got to keep the world safe and blah, 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 blah. And all these silly justifications for intervention in the Middle East, when really, if you understand the geopolitical situation that we're in right now, we have caused our own problems from this, you know, in terms of the immigration problem. So I feel like the consequence of the root of the problem is sort of overshadowed by this, this sort of, this culture war, as it were. Um, so again, not really sure that I'm asking a question, but what are your thoughts on that? There is a, there, there is a lot, a lot in that, uh, in that topic right there. Um, I don't, I don't know the whole circumstances of present Europe. Uh, I don't live there, obviously. Uh, from from my outside outsider perspective, from not living in the region and stuff like that, it's it seems to me apparent that there was a correlation between uh, intervention in the Middle East and migration from the Middle East. Um, and on the topic of people selling each other into slavery and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, as uncomfortable as it may be to admit, I've, I've seen it personally. I was stationed in Japan and we visited a, um, a place. I'm not going to give its name and I won't tell which country it was in because there are people that know what ports I've been to and stuff like that. But we saw people that were brought into a room, uh, to offer massages in exchange for money that did not look like they wanted to be there. I thought we were going to a bar, didn't realize what I was getting into until it was too late. And, uh, it's a, it's a country that this is very, very illegal in. So, um, the chances are it was run by a mob or a racket of some kind. But I think that, I think that as quality of life improves, people don't have to focus as much on basic survival and you can, you can temper the, uh, the primitive self survival kind of instinct of do whatever it takes for me to live. Uh, you can temper that with, uh, some sort of higher notions of wisdom and justice 
and the ideas that, that we talk about. So I think it's individually speaking, I have a responsibility to create my, uh, I, I have a responsibility to not impact my environment in such a way that would degrade others ability to, um, to develop in the way that I do. Um, and I, I came from a pretty, pretty terrible background. Uh, so whereas you said you came from uh, a, a liberal kind of background, I came from absolute poverty, pretty much. I, we had, we didn't have electricity for, for years. So, uh, it was, it was a completely, yeah. So my, my ideas, my lofty ideas of communism came from the, the desire to not see anybody live like me at first. And then I realized that that was dumb, but uh, growing up, growing up in an environment where survival was, was that kind of a thing. I could, I can kind of see that if you don't have people that are, that are speaking of wisdom, if you don't develop any ideal sense of justice of right and wrong, and then you have this kind of thing going on, it's a, it's a kind of positive feedback loop. And we see that all the time. Like we see it obviously in the war in the Middle East, you know, we create, you know, uncertainty and instability that that goes on to provoke its own problem and create more uncertainty and more instability or instability rather you know creating a worse and worse environment justifying more and more in the eyes of the people that are in charge of it a call to fight over there to fix it you know and just like with addicts just like with with people that have uh self-destructive behaviors of any kind there is no law. There's no amount of law. There's no amount of shooting. Just just shy of killing everybody that disagrees. There is nothing that you can do to force someone into a new perspective. They have to come to it on their own. They have to want it. And it's going to sound kind of silly, but if you've ever seen Star Trek, you're familiar with the Prime Directive. Uh, meddle not in the affairs of a pre-warp civilization or the temporal one. You know. But the the overall point is, if if people aren't willing to to do it on their own, aren't interested in looking into it. You can't force them to. The only thing you can do is, is approach them on their terms, offer the ideas and let people come do it on their own. So I, I really think that the, the migration issues throughout Europe right now uh, are, a, are a byproduct of, of a terrible foreign policy uh, and that stopping that foreign policy of, you know, aggression will tend to alleviate a lot of it. Now I, the, uh, obviously, it's going to come up. What's going to be done with these people now that they're here? Uh, will they want to go back? Will Will they just form small communities? And if there's if there's resultant crime from from people not respecting the way of life, uh, how how like with com with with places like Cuba, for example, the, the ideas of capitalism, the ideas of trade and stuff like that, win people over to capitalism. Uh, and how do you convert people but sharing the ideas? How better to convert people to the ideas of uh, individualism and free markets? Not to, not, but not to introduce yourself to them, but to have them willingly introduce themselves to you. So if you can, if you can apply an appropriate degree of justice, you know, prosecuting crimes appropriately, while at the same time allowing people to see the environment, that, that promotes individual, you know, individual liberty and stuff like that. I think it's a, I think it's an opportunity to grow the, the population of the world that respects rights. That said, Europe isn't a haven of rights. So it's kind of almost, a, <laughs> almost, almost going to contradict itself there. But yeah, you see what I'm saying? If you think that, if we think that the, the ideas of Europe are better than the ideas of domi- the dominant, the dominant groups that are the dominant individuals that, that guide and direct policy and people in the Middle East. If we think that the ideas of, of Europe and those kind of places are better, then let them come. Let them let them be there. Obviously, don't treat them any differently. Let the let you know let whatever crime people commit be punished as the crime should be. Uh, but at the same time, you know don't 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 attack people unjustly. One of the problems with the migrant crisis, like in Sweden, for example, <clears throat> the welfare state really does have this per- perverse consequence. They think that they're helping these people by taking them from uh, some place with deep poverty and just terrible, terrible conditions, right? And then they they bring them to this place where they have really not much of a community. They're they're sort of ghettoized. They're because the the Swedish people just wanted to kind of pat themselves on the back and be like, you know, we we did this great thing for these people. But then they just sort of gave them 
all of all of these resources and never gave them any sort of opportunity to engage themselves in the community around them and more importantly in the market so if we understand austrian economics right you know the praxeological explanation if you give people the wrong incentives then you sort of end up with malinvestment and you end up with crashes well you sort of see this with the and this is just from the little reading that i've done on this subject but i sort of see this in a cultural way with the way that we have these national national borders and welfare states that create perverse incentives. Praxeology isn't just an economic principle. It's a whole separate discipline, yeah. Right, it's fundamentally the social science side of economics that I feel totally gets ignored. Absolutely. That's that, that's totally to your point right there. The uh the social incentives, not necessarily monetary, the social incentives exist. And uh it drives it drives or encourages behavior. Uh, as people, we all have a responsibility. Uh, you know, it's I, I can't prescribe responsibility for other people, but we all have the uh, what makes us human isn't our ability to conform with the instinctual animalistic side of ourselves. It's our ability to refuse it whenever it would make the better sense in the long run, and that's kind of what's that's kind of what we you know we see whenever the the pressures are animalistic, the animalistic side tends to win out, and the, the incentive exists to be more animalistic. When there's a gun in a room of people that don't know each other, uh, and the, the only thing they know is like in a saw kind of st- fashion, one of them has the key to get out of the room inside their you know chest cavity, and there's a gun in the room, you know, <laughs> what's going to happen? You know, it, that's that's the way reg- I look at regulation. There's a gun in the room, and somebody's going to pick it up. Um, and the the same thing the same thing exists in in these kind of environments. There's a perverse incentive sitting somewhere, and somebody it needs it. It's a it's a very strong temptation. The, the only thing we can really do is control the way that that that, that uh, incentive is set. Because if it's a government providing an incentive, then the only thing you, you can't control a person's response to it, but you can control the incentive that you're offering. That's really all that, that the only tool that we have to positively influence each other is to control the incentives that, that we allow governments to provide in our name. I heard someone say this recently on a podcast, but they were saying uh, that the biggest trick that was ever taught to us like in public school these boring concepts of economics these really data-driven sort of uh uh, elements I, i don't know if you can completely blame it on on keynes himself but it seems like the the striving for uh the utilitarian and empirical analysis completely destroys the social science side of economics that started the the whole discipline in in and of itself. It actually came from Marx. If you've read Dust Capital, that's what he talks. That's he talks about that in the book. Uh, that that the uh, the the social the social side of stuff. Oh, I'm, I'm really trying to remember how he worded it. Man, that's gonna kill me. He talked explicitly about that though in in that book. Uh, there's actually a YouTube um, a YouTube ten hour long video series that narrates the whole book, and you can listen to it if you look for it. But but it's it's totally on there. Uh, the funny thing is, is ironically enough, the Frankfurt School by uh, oh man, uh, I mean I'm, I'm not going to try to remember all their names right now. But the Frankfurt School is a is a derivation of uh, Marxist theory that deals with the social elements of it, and talks about how the state produced art of the time is the uh, you know that's culture, that's beautiful, that's the kind of stuff we have to have all that kind of stuff, and it has to rigidly be exactly like this. You can't deviate. You know, that's, yeah, yeah. So I'm sorry for interrupting and interjecting that in there, but that, that totally hit, fit right along with what, uh, with what I was hearing you saying. No, and that's fine. Uh, and I think I had this instinct on the topic of art. Uh, when I was younger, we went to the art museum when I was a teenager, and they had all this modern art, and I just didn't get it. And I was just like, this, this stuff just doesn't make sense. It doesn't move me. Um, but all these people are talking very languidly and poetically about, you know, just this, this canvas with a painted, uh, stripe down it, you know, and, and it's just like, who decided that this was art and, you know, that, that this is what is going to define, uh, the, whatever the fifties or whatever it was, what was fine art at the time. So I almost wonder, and the more I learn about the Frankfurt school, the more I sort of, come to understand that 
that they really did have a huge part to play in how the populace perceived what is elegant and what is proper, you know? Uh, so if we're to apply those same principles of art to, you know, other facets of life, uh, such as such as economics, I suppose, tying that back, you know, they it's almost like we're prescribed certain, uh, as Tom Woods says, uh, you know, certain opinions that you're allowed to have and and you're not allowed to deviate from that Um, yeah the overton window yeah yeah so what i was kind of getting at too was that we could really understand a lot more about not just other people but ourselves by understanding economics it's just really really sad that uh we see economics and monetary policy as this super boring thing and i'm i'm still constantly learning i mean uh, the the convoluted nature of our central bank system. I'm trying to understand it so that I can be better prepared for uh, impending financial crises that come from the malinvestment of this system. But it's just so hard to to wrap my head around because I never had that context. We're being taught to think of it as just this thing that technocrats do and that nobody else can really understand in depth when really the nature of it should be in concert with uh, just the the social apparatus that is economics. Yeah, the game theory game theory deals a lot with it too. My my back in, background in economics uh, comes from a lot of reading. Obviously, I, I've read you know Hayek and Mises and Rothbard and all those guys. I, I've read I've almost finished Human Action. I didn't completely finish the the book. It's a hard slog. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's a walk. It's definitely it's definitely a walk. Um, but. The, there's also a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that's available on YouTube, uh, from and not from you know like Prager University or places like that. <laughs> not not to criticize them or anything like that, but you can you can see the full perspective of what you know high level economic classes t- will teach because there's lectures from Yale and Harvard and MIT and it's all available. Like one day I just had a you know stray hair you know that said hey I wonder you know I wonder about the Higgs field theory so I looked it up oh sure enough there's a lecture from MIT on Higgs field theory. And then Wikipedia syndrome sets in. Oh, I don't understand this term. Let me go watch another video on that. But you can do that with economics too, and you can do that with psychology and sociology. You know, any of the soft sciences, any of the hard sciences, and stuff like that. It doesn't. It doesn't take a you know a degree per se, to to be able to have some you know reasonable insight with it. Now, there's all obviously the Dunning Kruger effect of the less you know about something, the more confident you are in what knowledge of it you have. And then, you know, the, the curve kind of levels out and turns back up as you become, you know, more knowledgeable on a topic. I, that, that's always something I have to, you know, consider when I'm doing things. But whenever I can, whenever I can provide enough of an insight into something and uh, I think what I think to be valid criticisms of it, I, I feel that my, my, my talking on a topic wouldn't totally be, you know, able to be dismissed out of hand. Especially because one of my friends, econ professors from college, called me a crypto fascist because I disagree with his ideas on minimum wage. So, <laughs> yeah, which is really cute. Consider if you actually know the roots of the minimum wage. Like I was saying earlier, kind of goes back to the whole labor union thing, where they were trying yeah. to price out, uh, you know, blacks, Latinos, and Asians from the from the labor market. So, right, if you right. really want to talk about it, if you support a minimum wage, you're closer to a crypto fascist than then you would be being against it, in my opinion, knowing what I know. What is a crypto fascist? Is, is, is my fascism part of a blockchain somewhere? What are we getting at with this? You know? Do you mind crypto fascist coins? Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, I'm just using that sort of to fly, oh, no, fly in his it. face. But, but I mean, God damn, that, that term is just so pretentious. People do it all the fucking time. <laughs> and even people in the, the more, you know, culture warriors on the right kind of side of things will say that you're like a, they don't actually say crypto Marxist, but that's kind of what they're saying too, is that, you know, by saying, uh, for example, you could, you could disagree with Jeffrey Tucker all you want, uh, and all the other libertarians that are quote unquote open borders. Uh, but I don't think that you can, with any sort of intellectual honesty, call them left libertarians because they are free market. They are capitalist. You know, you're just being hyperbolic by calling them leftists because they don't agree with you or they're possibly to the left of you, uh, socially, you know, um, Unlike the uh, Dankertarians guy, who's oh god, like <laughs> yeah. uh, there's just cancer I'm sure all you've around. Seen that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. I'm like, I'm, oh great, another spoonful of pseudo intellectual masturbation. Good job, guys. Yeah, you know, <laughs> turn on a little bit more. I'm almost embarrassingly uh, into the whole petty squabbles of you know libertarian uh, personalities. 
it's, you know, I think it's just through osmosis that I've come to these communities where I'm seeing these conflicts. But um, you, you did touch on something a little bit ago that that I wanted to to bring back up, which was you were saying something about how, well, y- your options really are either you try to persuade these people with reason and logic and even the emotional arguments. Um, I'm really bad at doing that, by the way. I'm terrible at framing things emotionally because usually I'm I, I have just trained myself in such a way to just try to think about things in this really strict, rational way. Probably sort of goes back to the whole, you know, fetishization I had with Ayn Rand when I was younger and what, what sort of shaped uh, who I am today. But uh, I, I did sort of bring this up with someone recently because the conversation of free speech has been coming up, uh, which is its own culture war in itself. The the whole like punch a Nazi thing, right? That it's okay to use violence against people who have toxic ideas, which again, uh, you sort of see a parallel between the Christopher Cantwells of the world and the, um, you know, the people who... Who cannot be named because they're masked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's either like, so I'd said to one of these people who were arguing that, you know, we can't let Nazis speak, which, you know, obviously I think it goes without saying, I'm a normal person. I do not like Nazis. I don't think that they stand for anything that I find uh, agreeable at all. But they, if they're not using violence by my axioms, I can't promote using violence against them. So it's either, and you know, you see these stories about like a, the black guy who like befriended people from the KKK and got them to come away from it. That I think that guy did a hell of a lot more than any antifa person ever did by pouring piss on someone or punching them in the face and sucker punching them which is just such a bitch move you know like if you're gonna if you're if you really want to get into a battle with someone you do it hand and fist right in front of them the whole thing the whole thing shows their intellectual laziness with it too because if you think about it what is what what is what is violence for what are you trying to do if you have the moral high ground to defend yourself with aggression what is one punch gonna do is it gonna stop the person no is, is pepper spraying him going to stop the person? No. Is hitting him with a bike? Well, maybe you might hit him with a bike lock and end them. That would be a thing. But if you have the if you have the moral authority to defend yourself with force, a single punch isn't going to do it. And if you don't have the moral authority to defend yourself with force, then you should respond in kind. If they're spouting terrible ideas, beat them. It's not hard. You know, we need to have a pure, you know, ethnic nation. Why? What what is what is the biological advantage of that? Oh, so what you're saying right here is the the value of diversity is intellectual. Okay, cool. That's great. That's absolutely right. But what is the biological element you're you're trying to you know tie into this? It's not a, it's not just this or that. It's not a dichotomy. It's it, there's a whole range of things that go into it. So this this ethnic nationalism diffuse it, get rid of it. There's no re, there's no reason for it. If you want fresh ideas, new ideas, it has nothing to do with the color of someone's skin or their economic class. It has to do with them as a person. Learn about them. Don't be lazy. Right. And as if it needed to be said, I mean, libertarians are the farthest thing away from a Nazi as you can be, even though, um, do you know who existential comics is? I've seen a couple of their things floating around. So, um, some of the things have been good. I've seen some though. Uh, I mean, it's witty, it's funny. Uh, but I did see one tweet that, uh, he put out that it was something like, uh, anarcho capitalists are just Nazis who haven't found their leader yet which is just totally absurd because I'm not like a hardline AMCAP or anything. I, I certainly tend towards that ideologically, um, you know, but, uh, but I just think that is just so lazy and so stupid. Like it is, if you actually know the philosophy and this guy, you know, claims to be like uh, uh, an authority on philosophy, but he, he doesn't even take the time to read the source material. And again, I think some of the people that do this kind of shit, that are, are witty and smart, I think they do know better, and they're just sort of playing to their dumb base and to to sort of get the other side riled up, which he did. Um, but, but it, you know, anyway, uh, sort of going back to it, I sort of told this guy that I was talking to, I was like, well, you have two options. Yeah, you can rationalize with this person. You can try to, like, reason with them, even just show them compassion. And I know people... You know, I get kind of written off a lot as just like a, an ideological hippie, you know, because ultimately, yeah, my whole worldview and all of my ethics come down to some pretty, pretty basic uh, peace driven uh, motives. Uh, so, 
So it's like either you try to change their mind or you have to just like go completely politicidal and, and just kill everybody that you don't agree with. I mean, those are really your options. And I don't really think that there's a middle ground there. Like you, you're, you're either, you're either Hitler or Mao or Stalin or you're, uh, I don't know, like an ideological or uh, an intellectual figure like Noam Chomsky or Murray Rothbard. Like you have to just like you have to be a voice of reason. And I just don't feel like uh, no matter what your cause is, that you should be able to use violence against someone that that uh, that you don't agree with just simply on the principle that you're afraid of their ideas. Yeah, it's it's a it's a tough place. To, it's a tough place to be in. There's. I mean, you can you can hope that enough violence will scare enough people into submission, but what is that really worth? It's just a revolution in the future, you know. I can definitely see where you're coming from. Yeah. They, uh, I, I heard someone describe it that what what happened when basically ostracized the the more white supremacists in America. All it did was push them into the shadows, you know, 50 years, and now they're feeling around in the dark out in the internet and found each other, and that's sort of where the alt right came from in a way even though I, I don't really like using that term but just for the sake of brevity uh, i think it sort of you know fits well into the conversation the the point that you pointed out right there is people people feeling around on the internet for each other there there are so many people like if you're if you're a part of any of these uh, anarcho communist groups or left book groups at all which i may have outed myself i shouldn't i, I don't know how many people listen but that are part of those groups but being a part of those groups, it's a place where people that have problems can find each other and find sympathy. Uh, when you find sympathy, you gain a sort of collective we power that uh, that a bunch of other people that, that want to reaffirm your, be- your, your belief in your problems that, because they need the same affirmation and belief in theirs. Like... Imagine getting a bu- imagine getting a thousand kids that were bullied together into a into a small group, of, you know, an echo chamber to talk to each other and reaffirm, you know, the, their feelings or, you know, it, it would create it would create this you know sense of collective justice that they ought to go out and you know take care of anybody they perceive to be a bully, you know. I can see I can see that sort of stuff. There's little echo chambers of uh, you know affirmation forming, before before mass communication that didn't quite exist and to the to the uh, neo-nazi or whatever you want to call it that element of it there are tons of people that have found each other and have created that one of the another one of those positive feedback circles for each other where they will just you know step up and step up and you know escalate their beliefs and stuff like that one to, to prove the the purity of their idea that some of it i'm sure others to you know incite other people into participating and there there, there are so many things that work with it too there's there's some insidious kind of claims too, uh, for the neo-Nazi side that like, for example, the, uh, the Charlottesville thing was, uh, sponsored. Well, I don't really say sponsored, but organized by a guy who was a former Occupy Wall Street, uh, participant. Yeah. And stuff like that. So there's a bunch of things that work here. And how many of these Facebook profiles are sock accounts? Like if you look at some of these popular groups and stuff like that, you'll you'll start to dig into the the person that's you know saying something controversial, just to polarize people probably, and their profile is like some anime cat girl, or their profile picture is uh, a fake dude that you can you know go to Tin Eye and reverse image search and find out that it's just a stock photo, or, you know there's so many people out there that are fake, and um, it, I you you almost wonder if they are intentionally manipulating or if they're hiding themselves behind this fake profile or what's going on with that kind of stuff because they're they're definitely echo chambers uh, and it's a it's a reasonable thing to think to seek empathy uh for for the conditions or things that have happened to you in your life but when these echo chambers get formed there's the great potential for positive feedback leading to things like neo-nazis and social justice calls and class warfare calls and cultural warfare calls and ethnic warfare calls and all these kind of things because people and feed off, you know, feed off that kind of stuff. I'm very interested to see where, where we are in 50 years when this technology is no longer novel, when anybody can share ideas, when the, when the, when the, the, the faddishness of this sort of thing wears off. I, I, I tend to think of it like an intellectual form of like, man, Neopets or Tamagotchis or Pokemon cards from the day. It's just way more, way more, uh, 
rooted in human nature, you know, seeing this level of communication and the, the kind of things. I wonder when the wisdom and justice is going to become prevalent, common knowledge, that you should take what other people say with a grain of salt. You should weight the opinions of others who don't have, you know, valid, you know, valid you know, criticisms to, you know, valid reasons for just, you know, justifying their criticisms. Like you wouldn't take the opinion of a four-year-old on, you know, matters of finance. What the hell, what the hell does, you know, this profile that's a picture of a cat girl know about shit? You don't, they could be manipulating you. They could be lying. They could be, you know, hiding themselves. It, it, there's all kinds of stuff, man. So I'm waiting. I'm, I'm really interested to see where it goes in the future with that. I certainly fall for the collective thing quite a bit and, uh, you know, more than I'd like to admit, but I get on libertarian groups and sort of look for my confirmation bias uh, to get to get comfort in some ways because really we're a pretty fringe uh, pretty fringe ideology and not very many people are friendly to to your ideas. Some people are down downright hostile and will get violent with you when you you know just talk about some really what I think are really milk toast things like you know just talking about you know, ending the wars uh, in the Middle East, you know, like I've had some kind of monster. You don't want to kill people. (laughs) Yeah. And and to me, I don't get it. But I think to these people, what I'm doing is I'm challenging their identity in and of itself. When I say like, when I say taxation is theft, when I say that public education is indoctrination camps, and when I say that law enforcement in its current form is, is basically tyranny writ large and a and it's a it's a gang with legitimacy. That's kind of what the state is in some way. Um, but when when I say these more radical things, and and like I said, even if it's not even on the radical end, people f- feel like their identity is insulted. You know, when I when I uh, when I bring that stuff up, so it's like so it's kind of like it bridges when you bring up these controversial topics. It sort of bridges from the collective to that individual to a point where they become (laughs) their whole identity is wrapped up in this mythology, you know, of someone else. Yeah. That's, that's the big thing is people place their personally speaking. It took me a long time to to realize this and come to that conclusion, but it comes back to that thing I said about four year olds and, you know, advice on finance. When you, when you give other people an unjust amount of weight in their opinions uh, about you as a person, you damage your ability to reward yourself with with uh, the self esteem that you need. So people place their people place a sense of identity on a group that that they have a, a quote unquote group a, a, a social construct like you know uh, white people think X you know I'm white people and I don't conform with that therefore ah uh, problem you know my identity is broken or that white person did this what do you have to say about that. Well, crap! I, you know, I don't identify with that. I don't identify with the groups. It, 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 it puts me intellectually responsible for something I have no way of doing anything about, you know. And it, it, it allows people to place blame on me. So you can't, you can't, you can't use that kind of stuff. These pe- people giving the the weight of self esteem, impacting, influencing stuff to somebody else is a dangerous tool. That's why I think it's very important to be responsible for your own self esteem. Uh, and not allow people to to group and classify and things like that and and to not encourage people or to not fall into the bait of allowing them to in a discussion use their their you know group identity as a as a as a matter of their own identity i like to draw out their their own thoughts about themselves and to get them to think about themselves and say i more than we because i, I really think it draws more personal to them and I can have a discussion of them without the group that they identify with and get to the, the, the foundational identity that they possess. It's really, it's a, it's a different way of doing it. And it's kind of hard to do because most people don't think about these kind of things in this way. I also try to avoid common words when talking about these, these sort of topics, because if you set, if you use a trigger word, they put up a defense automatically and like copy paste an argument that they have prepared for this kind of stuff. So it's real, it's kind of important to do. Um, different terms than what people are used to when doing these kind of things. But identity with a group is a very dangerous thing. And so many people use it. It's, it's, it's hard to deal with. Right. And, you know, like, like we've said a couple different times is you're sort of fighting your uh, base instincts when we're, when we're talking about collectivism, because ultimately it comes from the smaller, uh, the smaller form of collectivism, which is tribalism, you know, uh, in when we were, 
hardwired as nomadic, you know, primitive humans, we, it, that was a defense mechanism in some kind of way. So I think in some ways we, we have to embrace our human nature in some places, which is uh, the nature of what motivates us to act and at the same time keep it in check because you know we as much as humans might not like to think it because we're tool using apes and we have all these uh, sophisticated pieces of technology we are still just organic you know uh, creatures and we have to realize that we can't just program other people and just have them think exactly like we do and especially we can't just uh, call for violence to be used against people in our name just because, uh, you know, because we feel like this other person's identity and their group identity is a threat to our very existence. Yeah, our identity, it's an existential threat. It's, that's, that's a terrible thing that's so prevalent, so prevalent. The farther we can distance ourselves from the animal side of things, I think, I mean, everybody that, man, I have so many arguments with people, but everybody wants to take everything to the extreme of whatever I'm saying, they'll be like, oh, I found a pinhole circumstance where that's not totally accurate, therefore your whole idea is bunk, and we should just be a totalitarian state. No, please, take it with a, gr take it with a grain of salt. Use, give it a little bit of uh, creative license. Give it, a, give it a bit of wiggle room. Don't, I'm, not, I'm not writing a, a program here. I'm not, you know, I'm not totally mechanistic. There's going to be some you know, slight inadequacy in the wording of it. What, what I'm saying is that like, the further we can distance ourselves from the animalistic behaviors, the the I think the the more co the more like cogent theories and the the better we can work and you know not have to deal with violence and warfare and you know pestilence and famine the, the more we can distance ourselves from the the tribalism the collectivism that kind of stuff the, I think the better off generally. You you know and I do want to say something. Uh, we should wrap up here soon, but um, when you when you were uh, when you were just talking. It sort of reminded me that often I get the insult thrown at me that I'm a utopian, uh, where if, if you actually listen to what we're saying, we are presupposing that people will commit violence and that we just have a high threshold for what we feel is justified use of violence. Uh, you know, so, so it's like sort of baked into the, the source material that informs our ideology that we're sort of coming from is... That, you know, um, and, and I catch myself getting into this collectivist trap, you know, as we've been talking about uh, by saying our ideology. But uh, anyway, I think we've identified ourselves pretty well to each other. So I don't think it's I don't think it's unreasonable to say we and you know, be not too far off with it. Right. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I guess uh, my point is that the that these axioms sort of uh, do account for human nature in and of itself. So I, I think by proxy, we expect conflict uh, and specifically conflict over scarce resources, which is like most conflicts ever uh, sort of come down to that. Uh, and I mean, interpersonal uh, conflicts are, you know, they're a thing, but I don't think that you can, you can really just throw the whole economic question of when to use violence out of the window just because of that. Um, but anyway, I guess my point is that I think it, the thing that appeals to me is that it seems like every other ideology that I look at is truly the utopian one. And I mean, especially once you get into the hard left where, you know, <laughs> Definitely. They, I mean, that's what it's all built on. They think that if we just have a dictatorship of the proletariat and that if uh, there's no bourgeoisie, there's no more class warfare, that there won't be any more crime, which I find to just be laughable. You know, because they're completely disregarding even the interpersonal conflicts that people are going to have, disregarding the entire economic thing. You just will never have a perfect human, in my point of view. Oh yeah, it, the whole the whole thing about like the communist side of stuff is it relies on creating a new communist man, right? Uh, and I I mean I mean man is in species, not gender, right? But creating it creating the new communist man, you have to mold everybody into the new mindset of this kind of thing. But if you happen to have one conflict, they're all like, abolish hierarchies. It's like, how do you have any kind of conflict resolution? What's going to happen? Oh, it's going to be put up to democratic will. So what you're saying is one person's automatically, inherently going to be subjugated to democratic will. What does one person being subjugated sound like? Ah, you're just a, you know, ANCAP fascist. <laughs> and it's like, oh, great. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the thoughts. <laughs> yeah.
I haven't heard that before. Well, all right, man. Uh, I think I think I've kept you long enough. Um, is there anything that you think we missed at all that you wanted to get to? Maybe we can get to it another time. Uh, no, I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. It was a good uh, good conversation. Um, I hit actually hit all my notes too. So. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe on your way out and find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash subversionwebcast.